Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really uh, a wonderful uh, pleasure and honor for me to welcome you here to the National Endowment for Democracy for our conference on the 30th anniversary of the historic breakthrough for Poland and Central Europe in 1989. We had a wonderful reception on Capitol Hill last night in the House Foreign Affairs Committee room with Elliot Engel, the chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and Jim Risch, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and other members of Congress to really uh, celebrate the address that President Fawensa gave to the joint session of Congress on November the 15th, uh, 1989. And we have with us today both President Fawetz, it's an enormous honor to have him with us, and also Leszek Balsarowicz, who will be speaking later, and who, as Deputy Foreign Minister, was the architect of the economic reform program in Poland in 1990. Today is actually, November the 14th, is actually the 30th anniversary of Lech Wałęsa's address to the FLCIO convention in 1989. I was there, I remember it vividly. It was just a glorious occasion. And Lane Kirkland, who led the, the president of the FLCIO, who led the support for solidarity in the United States, gave President Fawens the, the George Meany Human Rights Award, which had, that had been awarded to him in absentia in 1981 during the period when solidarity, before the uh, martial law, when solidarity was the first legal trade union and really legal institution, uh, independent institution in the history of communism. And Vawensa thanked the delegates for being our most steadfast allies in the trade union struggle for human freedom. And we're honored to have with us this morning AFL-CIO President Rich Trumka who will introduce Lech Wałęsa in a few moments. I want to thank the AFL-CIO and the other sponsors of this conference, the Bricklayers and Steelworkers Unions, as well as Wigniew Chernowski and the Polish American Freedom Foundation that, as I noted last night, uses legacy funds from the support for East European Democracy Act of 1989 to, to continue uh, the work of reforming and, and supporting democracy in Poland. And I also want to thank for their assistance in organizing this conference, the Lech Wałęsa Institute, the Civic Development Forum, which is headed by Professor Balsarowicz, and the Kassel Institute. Our purpose today is twofold. We want to celebrate the momentous breakthrough for democracy that occurred 30 years ago. And we also want to examine the present situation in Poland and Central Europe and the challenges that lie ahead. Our meeting takes place not just on the anniversary of Wences speeches to the FLCIO, uh, the US Congress, but also between the 30th anniversaries of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, which will be on Sunday, the 30th anniversary. And we're delighted that Shimon Panik is with us today because he was part of the Velvet Revolution and as in directing people in need, uh, he continues the, to carry forward the legacy of Václav Havel, another great leader from that, from that period. We're doing this in cooperation with our institutes. The NET has four institutes. And I want to read a letter, part of a letter, from uh, a member of the board of our National Democratic Institute, also a terrific former Senator Barbara Mikulski who wrote to us on this occasion, Poland has a rich yet melancholy history. For too long, Poland was occupied, partitioned, invaded, and sold out. Every king, kaiser, czar, or comrade who wanted a war in Europe started by invading Poland. Throughout the Cold War, Poland was forced behind the Iron Curtain, yet its heart, soul, and political orientation has always been democratic. So when Lech Wałęsa jumped over that wall in the Gdansk shipyard proclaiming the solidarity movement, he brought with him the whole world. I was so proud to support Poland as it joined NATO when I was in the Senate. 
we had a bipartisan group of senators who led the fight for ratification. Jim Risch from the Republican Party, the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, was with us last night and is head of the Friends of Poland Caucus in the Senate. We knew that Poland would be a valued partner in confronting the new challenges like terrorism and cybersecurity, as well as sharing the burden of defending Europe from the East. Yet we are all learning that democracy and the institutions of democracy cannot be taken for granted. The liberal forces must not be allowed to weaken the foundation on which our democracies are built. Democracy must be nurtured and protected. The democratic nations of the world must be vigilant to ensure that democracy will flourish into the future. It's now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today who will be from the administration, Bob Destro. Bob was a professor at Catholic University. He's written extensively on international law and the moral basis of human rights. He was a commissioner of the US Commission on Civil Rights in the 1980s, and he worked for many years with the Peace Research Institute in Oslo on interreligious dialogue and efforts to promote the release of prisoners of conscience in the Middle East. And in September, Bob Destro was confirmed by the Senate as the new Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. And as he told me when he accepted uh, the invitation to speak today, he proudly comes from a labor family. So labor will be taken seriously in the DRL Bureau now in the Bob Destro. Bob, welcome this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, uh, Carl, for uh, inviting me to represent the United States government here. Uh, and to mark the anniversary of President Valencia's speech before Congress. I'm honored to be among you today and to share the uh, podium with such honored guests. Let me start first by addressing President Valencia. We're inspired by your presence today, just as we were on that day 30 years ago when you stood at the podium in the House chamber. We are deeply impressed by the rise of Poland that began under your visionary leadership, and we thank you for your service to the Polish nation and to the world. And to you, Mr. Belsterowicz, we extend our recognition and gratitude for the difficult choices you made to reform the Polish economy. Your courage in the face of criticism transformed it into the powerhouse that it is today. Mr. President, I'll begin my remarks today with the same words that you used to introduce your speech before Congress. We the people. The storm of applause from the assembled members and senators confirmed that Americans and Poles understand that a yearning for freedom was written, on the, was written by the creator into the design of the human spirit. The applause confirmed as well that we the people yearn to be free together. That is, we're individuals whose nature demands that we act in solidarity with our families, friends, co-workers, and fellow citizens. Mr. President, you first inspired your fellow workers then the nation, and after that, the world. Your road was not easy. Your brothers and sisters in the Solidarity Movement shook the foundations of communism. As their leader, you gave voice to their aspirations and exposed the lie at the heart of the communist project. And for that, you and your fellow countrymen and women paid a tremendous price. Martial law, mass arrests and detentions, brutal dispersions of peaceful demonstrations and strikes, and the murder of innocent workers and priests. Solidarity's victory came at great cost, but it transformed Europe and the world. It was a victory for human rights, a reaffirmation of the inherent dignity of workers and of the work they do, 
and of the crucial role that solidarity plays in the life of democracies everywhere. But how did the Polish nation succeed when so many other freedom fighters have been crushed by their communist overseers? The answer, I think, lies in the credit you gave to Pope St. John Paul II for taking his visionary trip to Poland. You observed, and I quote, he allowed us to see how many of us there, there were. He awoke the Polish people and also the peoples around us, unquote. So I ask each of you in the audience today to think about that statement. Close your eyes for a minute. Ask yourself, how many of, there, how many of us are there? How many millions yearn to speak freely without fear of repression and retaliation? How many millions of workers want nothing more than to be treated by their employers as vital, intelligent, and talented human beings who literally put their hearts and souls into their work? How, I ask you, do we help them to make that vision a reality without getting uh, killed or imprisoned in the process? Our challenge, Mr. President, and honored guests, is to make it possible for others to see that they're not alone. That is, to see how many of us there really are. And that, Mr. President, is one of the most important things we do in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Along with key partners like the National Endowment for Humanity and the other core institutes, we support efforts to show how many there are. We suggest both gently and, for, uh, and forcefully, depending on the circumstances, that nations become stronger and more dynamic, as Poland has, when people are free to be creative together, and where the government protects access to public spaces, both physical and virtual, that they need to share and realize their visions for a better future. The revolutions of 1989 were not private affairs. They were public expressions of the will of the people. Without solidarity strikes, there would have been no electoral victory in 1989. Without the, multi, the Monday demonstrations in Leipzig, there would have been no fall of the Berlin Wall. And without the pro protests on Wenceslas Square, there would have been no Velvet Revolution. Your affirmation of we the people was and remains a testament to our human spirit and to our nature as individuals working and living together in community. Your struggle in victory 30 years ago challenges us to reaffirm our vision of freedom and our duty of solidarity with those who labor under the yoke of oppression. We see that yearning in Russia. When Muscovites had the audacity to ask for real choices in city elections, the Russian government responded with beatings and mass arrests. We see the cries in China, where government forces thousands of Uyghurs into, to work in re-education camps, where they and the workers with whom they are competing in other countries are robbed of the basic dignity and value of honest human work. And we see it in Iran, where the regime prioritizes spending to spread regional chaos rather than paying the pensions of truck drivers, school teachers, and others who earn the money in the first place. The list goes on in Africa, South Asia, and the Americas, to name only a few of the places. So while we commemorate Solidarity's victory, we also remember that we the people remains a very dangerous phrase in many parts of the world. It's also a challenge. We the people must do more than honor the legacy of solidarity. We have to live it. We must commit as governments, organizations, and individuals to help our fellow men and women around the world to reclaim the freedom that totalitarian regimes are stealing from them. We must show them by word and deed how many of us there really are. Thank you.
Our program this morning is going to be divided into two parts. Uh, and the first part, we'll be hearing from Lekvoensa and Lezik Balsarovic. And we're giving about an hour for that. And if there's time after uh, their speeches, uh, we'll have Q&A. Uh, we're going to break that part around 10.30. And then we're going to have a panel discussion that Dan Fried is going to moderate um, with Shimon Panik from um, the Czech Republic and also with three members of the NED board, uh, George Weigel, Ann Applebaum, and Toria Newland. I want to note, by the way, when you look outside, uh, you'll see we put up on the walls yesterday a lot of art that we had in the NED, which was solidarity underground art. Uh, calendars that were made in the 1980s with, with Lech Wałęsa's picture uh, and other forms of art, really brilliant art, the High Noon poster, Gary Cooper, for the June 4th, 1989 elections, uh, and other things. And so take a look at that. It's, uh, I think it's historic art, brilliant art, that was given to us as a gift by our friends in the Polish movement back in 1989 and, and, 19, uh, and 1990. Um, so we're now going to get to the first part of the program. And I want to note that when Lane Kirkland introduced Lech Wałęsa at the AFL-CIO convention 30 years ago today. He said that Wałęsa's visit was a triumph for every trade unionist who has kept the faith that one day the courageous struggle of solidarity would, would bring freedom and democracy to Poland. Wałęsa then told the delegates that solidar the solidarity movement is changing the political face of the world, and that movement has made possible, it had been made possible, not only through the peaceful struggle of working people, of trade unionists, it was made possible by trade unionists like you and I. It's now my great pleasure to introduce someone who has been carrying that struggle forward since he went to work in the mines in Pennsylvania in 1968. It's an enormous honor for me to present Rich Trumka, the president of the AFL-CIO, who will introduce Lech Wałęsa this morning. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, President Gershman, uh, Assistant Secretary Destro, uh, my fellow champions of democracy, I want to thank you very, very much uh, for introducing me, inviting me here today. Uh, and I'd also like to recognize two colleagues with us today who currently work for the AFL-CIO Solidarity Center, uh, Stoniek Staniszewski, uh, who was elected Regional Officer of Solidarność from 1980 to 1996, and Stanislav Chenyuk, uh, who was an elected officer of Solidarność in 80 and 81, uh, ambassador of Poland to South Africa from 1991 to 1997, and general director of the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs from 1998 to 2001. Uh, Stanislav is currently the Solidarity Center Country Program Director uh, to the Republic of Georgia. And I want to thank uh, both of them for their tremendous contributions. Uh, 30 years ago this week, uh, in a 24-hour period, Lech Wałęsa addressed both a joint session of Congress and the AFL-CIO convention, uh, perhaps the only person to ever do so. He received extended applause and a standing ovation at both of those institutions, a tribute to the hope and the excitement of that moment. See, America loves an underdog story. And Lech Wałęsa, with his working class background and direct approach, was the symbol of a growing movement for democracy in Eastern Europe and around the world. That same fall, I was leading my own union, the United Mine Workers, through a, a nearly year-long strike against the Pittston Coal Company. And we hosted and sponsored 
Polish miners in, in the midst of that struggle, forming an unbreakable bond and showing each other that solidarity really does know no boundaries. Across the Atlantic, in the face of growing doubts and defections, the Polish solidarity movement persisted, and they had no greater supporter uh, than AFL-CIO President Lane Kirkland and the American labor movement. Three decades later, <laughs> three decades later, we look back at the birth of free and democratic Poland, the values and the ideals we fought for uh, are now under attack. This is a time for determination and resolution, as well as celebration and reflection. The ruling law and justice party in Poland has taken control of the press and the courts. Migrants everywhere are being used as scapegoats and political chips. Even America's welcome, Matt, long a beacon of hope for immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers, including my very own parents, uh, is being bulldozed over right now. And during Lech uh, Wałęsa's address to the Joint Congress, uh, three words got the biggest response. We the people, not we the politician, not we the corporation, and not we the executive, but we the people. So let those words be our guiding light again today. Let us be unmistakable champions for the dignity of every human being. And let's bring freedom to every country on every continent. Real freedom. A free press, free speech, free elections, and the freedom to form a union. Eight, 1989 seemed like a, a dawn of a, a new day. But 30 years later, we must remember the words of a great American labor and civil rights leader, A. Philip Randolph, that freedom is never given, it is won. So let's continue the march for democracy unabated. Let's inspire and empower a new generation of young people who are willing to take risks and understand that there are no easy answers uh, and we must remain undaunted. Let Valenza reminds us that change can come from unexpected places and working people are always ready to answer the call of leadership. Let's answer that call again today. And as we reflect on those 30 years, I'd ask you to think about the courage it took, the courage of that man and thousands others like him that stood up and faced power and faced tyranny and refused to back down in the name of democracy. When common men and common women, virtually unknown today in the history books, will never know their names, stood together with arms locked and defied tyranny and demanded voice and democracy. And that man, Lech Valenza, stood at the head of them and risked the most. With that, it's my privilege and my honor to introduce you to the Honorable Lech Valenza. Excellent. I have the applause when I finish, not before I start, but <laughs> then this makes my task more difficult, but Szanowni I will do my best. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, fewer and fewer witnesses of the events from 30 years ago. Więc chyba na mnie spada obowiązek jako świadek tamtych zdarzeń 
parę rzeczy super mocarstwu przedstawić. So I guess it is my duty as the actual witness of those events uh, to uh, present to the superpower that the United States is uh, from a proper perspective. Bardzo mi zależy, by Stany odzyskały przewodzenie w świat. Because I greatly insist on the United States regaining its leadership position in the world. Ale żeby tak się stało, to muszą znać prawdziwe fakty niektórych zdarzeń. However, for this to happen, the United States needs to know uh, the real truth about the events that took place. A one często inaczej wyglądały, jak dziś są zapisywane w historii. And I must say that sometimes uh, they looked differently in reality than uh, they are now put, it, put down in history books. Z tych faktów takich inaczej pisanych niż wyglądały przedstawię tu dwa tylko. And let me point um, out to two facts that uh, today seem to be uh, referred to slightly differently than they were in reality. Oczywiście zdaję sobie sprawę, że nie wszyscy dobrze to przyjmą. Well, I'm uh, fully aware that not everybody will welcome this truth. Ale jak prawda, to prawda. But loving the truth, a truth lover that I am, I'm going to go on nevertheless. Pierwsza sprawa to rola Gorbaczowa w tych całych zmianach. Uh, the first truth being uh, the role that Gorbaczow played in all the transformation. Odegrał bardzo pozytywną rolę. He did play a very positive role, no ale, question about that. Ale pod przymusem, a nie z własnej inicjatywy. But he actually did it because he was forced by the developments. He never wanted to do it out of his own accord, kto on nie, his own accord. Kto nie wierzy, że mówię prawdę, niech zobaczy książkę kanclerza Kola, w którym on pisze. Well, if you have any doubts in what I am saying, uh, verify it with the book of Chancellor Kohl, uh, where he says... Około trzy miesiące przed upadkiem muru berlińskiego Ko Gorbaczow był właśnie u Kola. Uh, about three months before the actual uh, downfall of the Berlin Wall, uh, Gorbachev had been visiting Chancellor Kohl. Kohl go zaczepił, no, żeby skończyć z tym murem. And uh, Chancellor Kohl suggested something like, you know, how about putting the end to the wall? That's what he said to Gorbachev. Gorbachev odpowiedział krótko. Wrócimy do rozmowy za sto lat. And you know what Gorbachev's response was? I don't think that before a hundred years from now uh, we will, will be able to talk about this issue. That's what's his answer. A więc tu widać bezpośrednio, jaki był stosunek do tego wszystkiego. Which very easily and uh, openly demonstrates uh, what Gorbachev's attitude to the real developments were. I druga sprawa, którą chcę poruszyć i wyprostować, to jest upadek muru berlińskiego. And then, you know, we keep talking about the fall of the Berlin Wall. Let me be clear about um, what actually happened then. Wiele mia mieliśmy kłopotów i wiele niebezpieczeństw w tamtym czasie. Uh, we were faced with lots of risks, lots of dangers uh, throughout that period back then. Najbardziej niebezpieczny moment właśnie stworzyli Niemcy upadkiem muru berlińskiego. And I must admit that actually the greatest danger posed to us was by the fact that the Berlin Wall came down. Ja wiedziałem, że mur berliński upadnie, ale chciałem o tym zapytać i powiadomić Stany Zjednoczone, zanim to nastąpi. I knew the Berlin Wall was going to come down anyway, but what I wanted to do was to inform about that future and about uh, the, uh, and consult uh, this development with the United States. Niemcy zrobili nie, niedobry ruch. And actually, uh, the, the move that was made by Germany was really post a lot of dangers to us. Gorbaczow, gdyby się zorientował, by, by zniszczył całą naszą rewolucję. Uh, had Gorbaczow realized truly what it was all about, he would have destroyed, demolished all uh, the effects of our revolution. W tamtym czasie Gorbaczow na całym świecie miał bardzo dobrą pozycję. At that point, Gorbachev was really liked and admired uh, throughout the world. With a, he had a very strong position. Wielkie poparcie i uznanie Stanów Zjednoczonych i w ogóle świata. He was greatly supported by the United States um, and uh, actually by the rest of the world too. I w tej sytuacji powinien. And at that point, under the circumstances, uh, uh, he should have done the following. Powiedzieć światu. He should have said to the world. Widzicie, co robię. Uh, you can see what I'm doing. 
I am introducing perestroika and glasnost. Robię remont komunizmu, poprawiając jego błędy. I am reforming communism, correcting its errors and mistakes. Idę w kierunku wolności. And I am heading towards uh, freedoms and liberties. Nie zamierzam strzelać do was. I'm not going to shoot at you, attack you. Ale jednocześnie nie pozwolę na bałagan. But I cannot allow for any chaos at the same time. Nie pozwolę na destabilizację kierunku reform. I cannot uh, allow you for destabilizing the reforms which I'm implementing. Niemcy z NRD dezertujecie. And he could have said to these Germans, off you go, you can really um, leave the country. Because you want to undermine the Warsaw Pact and the order within Europe. I would not, I would never allow for that. He could, he would continue saying. You want to leave your country? Don't worry, you don't have to flee across Czechoslovakia and other countries. I will open up the borders for you. Provided you sign and agree to the following. That you are really abandoning the territory of East Germany. And the second thing that you, I would expect you to agree to, that would be Gorbachev's words, uh, would be, who do you want to take over? Your accommodation, your flats, your housing? Ukrainians, Asians. Do you want Ukrainians, uh, people from Asia? As I do not want to destabilize the peace, the order in this region of the world, I need to introduce these people there to keep the balance. And once uh, you have left, uh, I will then invite uh, the EU, uh, the United States, and conduct a referendum re referring to this territory. German people will never come back to it. That would be Gorbachev's words. To za sytuacja dla nas wszystkich. So this, this would have posed a terrible situation to all of us. That would have undermined the whole revolution and the whole effort of everybody contributing to it. In a peaceful manner on top of it. To tyle, co prostowania chciałem Państwu przedstawić jako supermocarstwu, który, który musi znać prawdę. So this is just an, um, uh, an asterisk to uh, straightening the knowledge of the facts uh, as the superpower. You need to know the facts. A teraz do tematu. And now let's get down to the to today's topic. Pols <laughs> <laughs> Polskie problemy, szanowni państwo, brały się przez wieki z naszego położenia geograficznego. Uh, Polish challenges have always resulted from the fact that uh, where we were located geographically. System komunistyczny został nam narzucony. The communist regime was imposed on Poland. Nigdy go nie przyjęliśmy jako własne. We never accepted it, we never approved of it as our own. Lata 40, zaraz po wojnie i 50, z bronią w ręku próbowaliśmy zrzucić te jazmo. In the 1940s and 50s, immediately after the Second World War, we tried to oppose uh, communism with arms. Ale przy pomocy sąsiadów i Związku Sowieckiego zniszczono ten opór. But with the assistance of our neighbors and the Soviet Union, these efforts were suppressed. In the 1960s and 70s, uh, we would organize strikes and uh, walk out in the streets to demonstrate. These resist uh, that, that resistance was suppressed too. However, following trials and attempts, we reached that concept. Musimy wspólnymi siłami razem wystąpić. And the idea that we needed to integrate our efforts, our forces, in order to oppose. Ale komunizm też o tym wiedział. But obviously communism was aware that that would be the way against it. I dlatego rozbijał każdą możliwość zorganizowania się w celu właśnie pozyskania większej siły. That's why the regime would always disintegrate any group trying to get together uh, in opposition to the system. I wyśmiewał nas, a ilu was jest, co wy reprezentujecie? 
And the authorities would ridicule us, saying, oh, how few of uh, you are there, you know, whom do you really represent, they would be selling, uh, telling us. They would also tell us, don't you realize that there are 200,000 Soviet troops based on the Polish territory to control you permanently? Don't you see there is another one million of uh, Soviet troops in the surrounding countries, they would tell us. And they would be re-whispering into our ears, don't you realize that there, is nuclear mis there are nuclear missiles there too? W taki sposób załamano naród polski, zresztą cały świat. So telling us all that, they really made us feel totally disanimated, totally hopeless. And actually that frustration covered the whole world. Ale tu do końca zbliżała się druga tysiąclatka chrześcijaństwa. But this coincided uh, with uh, the end of the second millennium of Christianity. Na tą okoliczność Polak został papieżem. And under the circumstances, what happened was that a Pole was elected to papacy. Po roku od wizyty przyjechał do Pol od wybrania przyjechał do Polski. And uh, a year after this election, uh, he came over to Poland cały, on a pilgrimage. Cały świat zwrócił uwagę na Polskę, co się dzieje w tym komunistycznym państwie. And the whole world was uh, looking in amazement at what was happening in that supposedly communist country. Fifty years of uh, communist indoctrination, and here we have almost all the Polish people praying together with the Pope. Nawet komuniści, i policja polityczna brała udział w spotkaniach w różnych miejscach z Ojcem Świętym. To the extent that even communists themselves and the secret police were there attending masses uh, with John Paul II. My wielu z nich znaliśmy przecież. Uh, we knew many of them, we knew who they were. Oni się nawet nauczyli robić znak Krzyża Świętego. And you know, they actually well, learned to cross themselves. Patrzymy, co oni wyprawiają. And we looked at them with astonishment. What the hell? What the, well, what the earth were they doing? Sorry about that. <laughs> that, was, that was my slip of the tongue, not presidents. Słów się nie nauczyli. Jeden, dwa, trzy, cztery. Ale krzyż był. They didn't know the proper wording. Um, they, they would say like one, two, three, four, but the sign of the cross was there. Temu wszystkiemu przyglądali się Sowieci. The Soviets were actually kept, uh, keeping a watchful eye on all the developments. W and they began to panic. Ale był taki nieduży sekretarz, który mówił, w tej sytuacji trzeba remontować komunizm, bo inaczej upadnie. And that, uh, um, that allowed for a minor secretary somewhere uh, to realize that communism needed reform or otherwise it would collapse. Przywieźli go do Moskwy i mówi, no to remontuj. He was brought over to Moscow and was told to introduce the reform. I on rzeczywiście zaproponował perestrojkę i głasność, wierząc, że to się uda. Which he actually did. Uh, he proposed perestrojkę and glasnost, believing that it could be effective. Ktoś tam w tym czasie próbował zabić Ojca Świętego. Someone at that time tried to assassinate uh, John Paul II. Ale wtedy okazał się nieśmiertelny papież. But back then he proved to be immortal. <laughs> Panika jeszcze większa. So the Soviets panicked even further. Właściwie nic się z tych wielkich spraw w tej prestrojce głasności nie udało. But truly speaking, at prestrojka and glasność today, uh, we do realize that none of the major goals of that effort succeeded. Nie uratował Związku Sowieckiego. Gorbaczow never saved the Soviet Union. Nie uratował Układu Warszawskiego. He never saved the Warsaw Pact. W tych dużych sprawach kompletna klęska. Which would go to say that all his major goals actually failed. It was a total failure. But you might be surprised why sh I should be talking about failures on such occasion. Quite simply because, as you may remember, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his failures. So Gorbachev uh, received his Nobel Prize for failures. I received mine for success. Two Nobel, two Nobel Prizes, just for the same thing. Ale mówię przede wszystkim dlatego, że dzisiaj też słyszę, że nie zbudujemy jedności europejskiej, nie zbudujemy globalizacji. But I am uh, 
referring to this right now because today I can also hear that it will be impossible for us uh, to implement globalization, that it will, it will be impossible for us to uh, integrate. A ja i odpowiadam, już wtedy też mi mówiliście, że nie ma najmniejszych szans na obalenie komunizmu. But my response is, I heard that before, I heard there was not the least of chances of bringing communism down. A to wszystko, co my dzisiaj robimy i tworzymy, polega na tym, że rozwój techniczny cywilizacji wymusza na nas te wszystkie zmiany. And what we are actually uh, going about implementing today results from the mere fact that adv uh, technological advancement forces us to integrate, to grow, uh, to establish la larger structures for ourselves. Sprawdźcie w książkach, jak nasi pradziadowie wymyślili rower i trochę technologii, to pozbierali te różne osady i zrobili z tego kraje, państwa. Maybe you can check it with history books, but when our forefathers invented, invented bicycles out of villages and settlements, they organized themselves in states, in countries. Jak my wymyśliliśmy internety, samoloty i tyle tej technologii dobrej i złej, musimy powiększyć struktury zorganizowania. And now, once we have invented um, the internet, uh, jet planes, and lots of other technologies, some better and some worse, we are forced to organize ourselves in larger structures. Technology nie mieści się w tych państwach. Oczywiście stanie to wielki kraj, ale popatrzcie na Europę. Uh, because this technology, for the simple reason, cannot be confined to smaller countries. Obviously, the United States is huge, but look at Europe. Wiele krajów w Europie jest malutkich, oni nie mogliby mieć samolotów, bo jak wystartuje, to nie zląduje w tym państwie. Uh, some countries within Europe are so tiny that they couldn't have really domestic air, uh, airlines, because once they take off, they already enter the airspace of the neighboring country. A więc ja zabiegam o to, by Stany odzyskały przywództwo w świecie. So, in view of all that, I insist so very much on the United States regaining its leadership position. Oczywiście w nowym stylu. Obviously, a totally new style leadership. Nie dolary, nie robienie za świat, no. Not, not meaning providing money to the rest of the world, uh, doing things for the rest of the world. Ale widząc, co się w świecie dzieje, jakie są wyzwania, proponowanie rozwiązań i nakłanianie innych do tych rozwiązań. But the United States realizing what is happening throughout the world and then coming up with proposals and uh, encouraging the others uh, to implement these proposals, these solutions. Prawie wszyscy, a szczególnie narody, chcą zmian, widzą potrzebę zmian. All of us, the people in all the countries, uh, want some change. Wybierają przywódców, którzy mówią, że będą zmieniać. And they elect the leaders, politicians, who claim that they will implement change, they will bring about change. A politycy w tym Stanie Zjednoczonej nie przygotowują rozwiązań na te czasy. Meanwhile, the politicians, the United States included, have not prepared the solutions. Tamta epoka wypracowała, dopracowała się dobrych struktur, dobrych programów, ale na tamte czasy. The old era somehow worked out the organizations, the platforms uh, that proved effective under those circumstances back then in the old era. Dziś właściwie w prawie wszystkie organizacje, struktury musimy trochę skorygować. Whereas today, almost all of them, all our institutions, all our structures need some correction. Dla mnie, dla rewolucjonisty, stoją trzy wielkie pytania, na które chciałbym zauważyć odpowiedzi. So, as a revolutionary, I would like to find answer to three basic questions that I can find now. W tamtej epoce każde państwo, każdy kraj do, dopracował się swoich rozwiązań, ma swoją historię. In the old era, separate countries, based on their history, worked out their own principles, their own foundations uh, that were their grounds. Są róż duże różnice w rozwoju, różnice w strukturach, w wychowaniu, a nawet o religię. There are such great differences among the countries uh, in the standard of living, in their development, their progress, education of the people, even religions. Na takich różnicach trudno jest budować coś większego. And if we differ so much among us, it's so hard to integrate ourselves in order to establish a larger structure. Europa zniosła granice między państwami. Europe has opened up borders, eliminated borders within the, uh, the continent. Prowadziła pieniądze, euro. 
It has introduced a single currency, euro. And almost any citizen of one member state can work in any other member state. Which is, oh, seems an incredible accomplishment within uh, the lifetime of one generation only. My father died in the war. Uh, my dad uh, was killed during the Second World War, defending the border of Poland. And what have I done? His son, since then, I would love to have an opportunity to have a chat with him. And I would love to be able to uh, tell him, listen, Dad, I know you died for the Polish border. But you know what? Today, there are no soldiers guarding the Polish-German border. And I wouldn't be able to finish that sentence because he would die of an immediate heart attack before I finished. Incredible. Incredible. Nobody really guarding the border. That means we have accomplished really so much. But I think we are slowly reaching the cul-de-sac uh, with no entry further on. And unless we really introduce the corrections, we shall not be able to progress any further. The first question that requires an answer what should actually serve as the common foundation for that new integrated project? Uh, when I present this uh, question mark in different um, uh, conferences, uh, I immediately uh, witness a division uh, into two almost equal parties among the audience. Uh, some 50% claim, oh, we don't need to invent anything new. Why don't we base ourselves on Freedom, freedoms, liberties, free market, economy, and that's it. Legal regulations, maybe. And the remaining half claims nothing solid can be grounded in that. Sooner or later, populism, demagoguery, and money for love will make you clash. Why don't you draw conclusions, lessons from the past? And agree among you all 10 values, so to say, that you can all share. And if you reach a consensus on such a decalogue of values, only then Put on top of it free market economy uh, and legal regulations, and then your structure will be solid. For the moment, neither of the 50% wants to give in to the other, and that's why uh, we have this uh, permanent clash. And it actually uh, gives the rise uh, to this encouragement to the United States to maybe take the decisive step and decide which side should win. And once we reach the consensus on this, there will be uh, yet another major question to be answered. What should serve as an effective economic system for this new structure? Na pewno nie komunizm. Certainly communism is out of the question. No, się w żadnym państwie na świecie nie sprawdzi. Because it has not proven effective uh, even a, in a single state throughout the country, uh, throughout the world. Z góry odpada. So that is out of the question. Ale też nie pasuje na dzisiejsze czasy ten stary kapitalizm. But on the other hand, the old uh, form of capitalism is not suitable for the new times either. Na pewno gospodarka wolnorynkowa, to jest jasne. Certainly one element that we will have to keep will be free market economy, that's Ale unquestionable. Ale kapitalizm widać to na Europie polegał na tym, że było państwa między sobą ścigały się, kto taniej, kto lepiej, kto więcej zarobi. But on the Bez example... Robocie, a mały problem. But on the example of Europe, we can very clearly see that uh, the old capitalism uh, really 
consisted in competing, rivalry, uh, nobody really cared about the neighbors, about unemployment, elements like this. Someone uh, referred to it as a rat's race among different countries. But if we are integrating Europe to create one state called Europe, and tomorrow we will be globalizing the world, this competition, rivalry among the countries will be over. Which goes to say, half of the con uh, content of the concept of capitalism has already been rejected. <laughs> I trzeci wielki problem, na który trzeba znać odpowiedzi. And there still remains the third issue that requires an answer. To jest populizm, demagogia i kłamstwa polityków. How to handle populism, demagoguery and politicians' lies? Musimy brać nawet, nawet przykład z boksu. I guess we uh, could follow um, uh, the example of boxing, a sport. Się, ale koniec rundy, cześć, cześć, w porządku gra. You know, you, you, you see two boxers fighting, fighting one another, but the round's over, and the fight is over. They go back to their positions. I tak samo tu musimy ustawić, żeby, to, żeby wolność była zachowana, ale jednocześnie i odpowiedzialność. So I think we just need to regulate things in a similar way for the freedom to, uh, you know, for freedom of people to be doing things, to be fighting, to be opposing, but then to have the rules in place. Nie uh, in the old era, we did not really insist on e equality. Wolność, ale i odpowiedzialność. To and equality between uh, freedoms and responsibilities, and they need to be balanced. Masz prawa, oczywiście, ale i obowiązki. You do have rights and privileges, but at the same time, you do have responsibilities. Jeśli tu podrównamy, and if we manage to bring about this balance, i tego życzę super mocarstwu, i o to zabiega. that would be ideal, and I would like, uh, love the United States, the superpower, uh, to help us achieve it. And that's what I've been insisting on. Życzę, że mnie zaprosicie szybciej niż za 30 lat. Hope it to be reinvited here again sooner than in 30 years from now. I to, co, o czym mówiłem, to wszystko przedyskutujemy, aby się nawzajem przekonać. And we will have an opportunity to really debate things that I have just said and other people have said to convince one another. Po starej epoce, która była brzydka, brudna, wojowania, nikt nikomu tak naprawdę nie wierzy. Uh, the point is that after the old era, which was so really dirty of dirty fight, we are so mistrustful of one another. Nobody trusts another. Dlatego ja na skróty powiedziałem tak. Jedna epoka wielkich podziałów granic upadła dzięki so, nam. Briefly speaking, I would uh, illustrate it with the following words. Uh, one era, the era of deep divisions, has collapsed, also thanks to your contribution. Pojawiła się epoka intelektu, informacji, globalizacji. The new era uh, of intellect, information and globalization is on the horizon. Epoka na wielki pokój i dobrobyt. Uh, uh, implying and um, promising well-being and uh, wild, uh, widespread peace. Ale nasze jest, jest po tych, tych epok. But the trouble is, we're still in between the two. Ja nazywam ten czas epoka słowa. And I refer to it as the era of the word. Ep musimy porozumieć się, dogadać się, wybrać rozwój i odpowiedź na te trzy pytania. This is the time when we need, uh, need to communicate, when we need to debate things in order to be able to choose the best solutions for that new era. Stary, and as I am really growing old, it will be your task. Zrobicie, and if you are successful, I will take the credit for it. Dziękuję. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Buenza. That was great. We could discuss that forever, but we don't have time. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Greg Lebedev, who is the senior advisor and to the CEO of the United States Chamber of Commerce and 
which is the largest business federation in the entire world. He's also the chairman of the Center for International Private Enterprise, which is one of NED's four core grantees, along with the Solidarity Center, Labor, and our two political party institutes, NDI and IRI. He's held many senior government positions at the State Department at the, and the White House. He's a great friend who's deeply committed to NED's global mission, and he will introduce this morning Leszek Balcerowicz, who was the architect of the economic reforms in Poland. Greg. Thank you, Carl. You have convened an important event this morning, and I'm very pleased to be, uh, to be a part of it. And I'm pleased also to, to be able to speak about an important individual about whom we don't speak enough. Uh, in 1989, Leszek Barcelorowicz made history when he became the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance in the first non-communist government in, of Poland after World War II. As the chief architect of Poland's economic transition, he had a vision and the courage to implement market-based reforms that turned a failing, centrally controlled socialist economy into one of the most dynamic economic engines in Europe. These groundbreaking reforms aimed to curb hyperinflation, balance the national budget, and build institutional foundations of a modern and competitive economy. And they worked. You cannot hope to build prosperity without creating an ecosystem that enables private enterprise. Or as Lessig once quipped, you can't be for milk, but against cows. <laughs> Unfortunately, governments around the world get that wrong every day. And it never ceases to amaze me that so many supposedly smart people fail to understand that the only route to a free and prospering society is through democratic government governance and free market capitalism. The Center for International Private Enterprise, a NED core institute, as Carl said, where I serve as the board chair, worked to support the Barcerowicz vision and an agenda of reforms by helping to transform the Polish Chamber of Commerce from a state-owned entity into a private organization driven only by the needs and concerns of its member businesses. The Barcelovich plan was painful. Detoxification usually is. But it put Poland squarely on the path of growth and eventually enabled it to join the European Union in 2004 when Barcelovich served as president of the National Bank. Not surprisingly, Minister Barcelovich has continued to do good work since those heady times. He was a, he's a member of the UNDP's Commission on, on uh, Legal Empowerment of the Poor. He's a senior member of the influential Washington-based financial advisory body, the Group of 30. He's a professor at the Warsaw School of Economics. He's the founder and chairman of the Warsaw-based think tank Civil Development Forum. Poland's transition experience is a model. Uh, it clearly demonstrates that the key to economic transformation is building an environment that supports inclusive growth and attracts constructive capital investments that are market-oriented and well-governed at both the funding source and at the destination. Such investments incorporate ethical and transparent business practices that help local economies and democracies alike. And all of these characteristics have served Poland well. Yet the impressive progress made over the last three decades may today be showing a little wear and tear which, may, uh, which is of concern to those of us who admire the courage, resilience, and success of Poland and its people. The current democratically elected government, a member of the EU and a staunch American ally, seems to be listing toward policies that promote unsustainable levels of social spending and an increased role for the state in the economy while drifting away from programs that encourage entrepreneurship innovation, job creation, increased productivity, and rule of law. This is puzzling for a country that clearly appreciates the power of the private sector and has measurably benefited from the forces of the free market 
since the democratic breakthrough of 30 years ago. Consequently, there are those today who worry whether Poland will remain at the vanguard of economic reform in Central Europe. And they worry because Poland has an important role to play in all of Europe, both as a model market economy and as a proud and sovereign state unintimidated by its neighbors to the Northeast. Who better to address the concern that the, than, the, than these concerns than the father of Poland's economic transition? And please join me in welcoming to this microphone the Honorable Lisa Arcelowicz. Do I still have 20 minutes? Yes, 20 minutes, okay, as agreed. <laughs> okay, let us start with some basic facts without which we cannot understand the importance of transition after communist or socialism. <clears throat> there are some countries <clears throat> which used to be at the same per capita level, but then their trajectories sharply diverged. To look at North and South Korea, the same culture, the same nation, the same history. They used to be equally poor 50 years ago. Now North Korea had 7% of South Korean per capita income. Look at East and West Germany. <clears throat> 50 years have sharply diverged the economic uh, situation. <clears throat> Poland and Spain in 1950, we had similar per capita income in 1990, we have around 40% of Spanish per capita. What is the main reason for that? It is not culture, it is not location, it is not climate, it is institutional regime or system. Sharp differences in institutional regime produce, after a while, huge differences in the standard of living. And institutional regimes differ on several dimensions, economic freedom, civic freedoms, rule of law, and democracy. In other words, open political competition or different mechanisms. Socialists or communists were such a bad regime. <clears throat> when I say socialist, I mean the same as some people call communism. Let me make a digression because I've noticed that many persons are in love with the same socialism. <laughs> but the essence of original socialism was clear. It was anti-capitalism. It meant that uh, private ownership had to be replaced by the monopoly of state-owned enterprises. And markets have to be replaced <laughs> by central planning. It was absurd from the very beginning, but it was very popular. Which means that in politics, from time to time, we have passions, bad emotions, which lead to destructive results. It is because of Marxists that Bolsheviks, headed by arch-terrorist Lenin, have won. And this has changed the history of the world for the next 80 years. So we have to look very carefully what is happening in politics under the influence of hateful slogans. Now, what was the logic of this bad system? <clears throat> the primary feature was the elimination of economic freedom, of private ownership and markets. Then once it was introduced and maintained, economy had, had, cannot develop compared to relatively efficient market economies which led to the growing gap in the standard of living. How could you maintain the obedience of the population? By force. So bad economic results lead to the unavoidable application of intimidation and terror. Of course, there were free elections, <laughs> but everybody knew that this was a sham. <laughs> So what was the most important institution of socialism? KGB. And their counterparts in other countries, because without KGB, without intimidation, socialists would dissolve. 
under the pressure from your population, which had to be intimidated. intimidated. <coughs> now, we know quite a lot about the link between various systems and their outcomes. We know that there are some bad systems, but they can persist because of intimidation and propaganda. So we have to be very watchful when we see early signs of such bad transitions. From time to time, bad systems collapsed. And this is what has happened. <laughs> it was unpredictable, to be sure. It collapsed because of an unpredictable combination of various factors, including the activity of great men like Leg Wawensa. And once it collapsed, and collapsed the earliest in Poland, then the question arose, what about transition? Now, once Poland became free in 1999, there were no major doubts about political transition, meaning changing political system, because most people understood that the Western political model, competitive elections, in other words, democracy, <coughs> rule of law, which means in politically independent justice system. There is no rule of law when justice system, meaning police, secret services, prosecutors, and judges are politically captured. And defense against attempts to reduce rule of law is at the defense of the independence of the justice system. This is operational. Now, so, but there was no major doubt 30 years ago about direction of political change, as I said, democracy, rule of law, local government, which will end free media. <clears throat> and we achieved a lot. And we have achieved throughout many elections and many successive governments. The initial direction has been until recently maintained. There were probably more doubts or questions e regarding economic transition, which meant massive economic liberalization. I am using this artificial distinction between political and economic, but it is artificial. Because what is the worst political problem? It is excessive concentration of political power, which has to be divided in a wise way, checks and balances. But the worst catastrophes in human history have happened because of excessive concentration of political power, which was communism or socialism, and there were many, many million people who were killed because of this excessive concentration of political power. You know what Lord Acton has said, every power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And from time to time, you have monsters, which is like Stalin, like Mao, who get this power, and then you have genocides. But I want to stress they're reducing political power. Also with respect to economy, it's extremely important political reform. Because you can't have democratic socialism, meaning state ownership is a monopoly and democracy, it's impossible. So when I was working on economic reforms, I also realized that it's absolutely indispensable, a fundamental political reform. Privatization, liberalization are fundamentally important. But of course, there were some more concrete questions, all the more that we inherited a mess, a chaos. In 1989, we have hyperinflation, prices were growing at the rate of 20-30% amounts, production was falling, and uh, there were massive shortages. So this was the challenge. This was much worse than, for example, in former Czechoslovakia, or in Hungary, then inflation was only 30% or 10%. <clears throat> when I accepted the kind proposal of Tadeusz Mazowiecki, proposal supported from Bayrek Wałęsa, <laughs> I accepted it because, after intensive hesitation, if I say no, because of certain factors. <clears throat> First, I had a hope in the late 70s and in the 80s, I created an informal group who worked as a hobby 
on uh, reforms. We have not foreseen that it would be useful. But we did our homework, and the strategy emerged from this homework. What is the conclusion? Even in the gloomiest times, have a hobby which seems to be useless, but may be useful. And the window of opportunity arises. <laughs> So this was that indispensable condition, otherwise I would never accept it. It would be heavy, ir irresponsible. But there was a blueprint based on this hobby, and there was a team which, which entered the commanding heights of the government. Second, we agreed with the leadership of solidarity that only radical and rapid and comprehensive reform has a chance. <clears throat> and I come to that. And slow or gradual reforms, hopeless. It would not be sustained and would not produce beneficial results. The third that I, conditions which were accepted, that I take responsibility for the overall uh, economic policy, not only for finance, but also for reforms. <clears throat> and so it started. Many people rightly stress that Poland was a pioneer, that's true. And there, was, there were no textbooks. But there were some useful hints. First, it was we divided the whole economic policy into stabilization, meaning lowering inflation, and transformation, meaning changing the system for the better. On stabilization, we did not need to discover America. High inflation is always produced by the excessive production of money, which finances budget deficits. So we have to cut it. There are no other solutions to this. So we did it, and after a while, inflation has fallen. I had the pleasure, many years after 89, as governor of Central Bank, to bring down inflation from 10% to below 2%. So the job was finished. On transformation, we asked, I asked the following question. What is the most important for Poland beyond changing a political system? And it was clear to anybody who knew Poland's history that we lost a lot of time vis-a-vis -vis the West, and the most important task was to catch up, to introduce such a system which, if maintained, would ensure that Poland would grow much faster than the West. Then the question was, what system? And there was no doubt. I don't think there's any doubt, reasonable doubt, what systems if introduce and maintain, produce economic growth. First of all, they have to be based on private enterprise. State enterprise is always a problem under any political system, which invites political intervention. Secondly, lots of competition within the rule of law. Rule of law is very important for democracy, but also for the economy. Equal treatment, no favoritism, no oligarchic capitalism but free market, rule of law, capitalism. Third, moderate taxation, which requires moderate spending. So we have to keep spending under control. Local government is an important part of the overall state structure. So this was the guiding model. But the most important and probably most tricky question was the transition. Transition is always most tricky. <laughs> because it's easy to agree where we want to get land. It's not very difficult to diagnose the situation, but what about the transition? <laughs> but here again, the choice was between a slow or delayed or partial strategy, which was adv advised by most economists, including in Poland, and rapid and comprehensive transition. And based on the previous work, in my team, I was completely sure, we are completely sure that gradual strategy is hopeless. It could not succeed. It could not produce improvement. And if we failed, then this was a political, political problem for solidarity and for Poland. Against this hopeless strategy, a radical and comprehensive one seemed to be only risky. And risky strategy is always better than hopeless. So if you are faced in such a situation, choose a risky strategy if alternative is a hopeless one. 
And this was the characterization of the situation. Now, you know, after many years, and based on lots of research, that countries like Poland and the Baltics, which followed this strategy, have achieved much better results than other economies which either delayed radical change or do, did it slowly. We were at about the same per capita income in 1989 with Ukraine. And now we are much richer. Hopefully, Ukraine is accelerating, and Ukraine deserves all kinds of support. All kinds of support, including military. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of data which I would not quote, but all of them convincingly show that radical and comprehensive reforms bring about better results for the people. It is always said that they are painful. But one can compare this pain with the pain of non-reforming. It is, uh, I think, an, a mistake to associate the word painful or social cost only with radical reforms. Words matter. It's like saying your the doctor that therapy of serious ill, Ill, Ill patient is very painful, without comparing the state of the patient without the therapy. So language matters very much. <clears throat> now, so we have this experience and radical and sustained strategy works better an alternative strategy. This is the lessons of experience and the massive research. But, and this is my last part of my remarks, accidents happen, not only on highways. Accidents happen in politics too. <laughs> By accidents I mean what has happened in some countries, including my own country, after recent elections. And uh, the worst part of it is, as it was mentioned, it was an, it has been an attack against the rule of law, which is an indispensable basis for the lasting democracy. No rule of law, no lasting democracy. You look at what is happening to the leaders of the opposition, say in Russia, which are imprisoned, which are falsely accused, etc. And let me repeat, that the essence of the rule of law is an independent justice system, especially criminal justice system. We have a very lively civil society in Poland. Some of members are here who are actively opposing what is happening to, in Poland to the rule of law. And I think with the expansion of this movement, and of course, solidarity from other democracies, we would win. And we would uh, reverse what is bad and continue what Poland needs. Continuing building of a system which is based on freedom within the rule of law. And continue catching up with the richer countries, meaning the West. Thank you very much.